I would like to call the Monday, March 14th, uh, 2022 Common Council meeting to order. Clerk Jones, I believe that you would like to make some comments regarding the link for the meeting and other expectations. Yes. Good evening, members of the public. For audio quality, we will be muting everyone not speaking by default to maintain good audio quality for the council members as well as yourselves. If you would like to speak during the meeting on specific agenda items, and this is to those that, that are in the virtual audience, please submit your request to speak in the chat. Directions to do so are also located in the chat. We ask that you pro provide your full name and address as those are required for all in-person meetings. If you would like to be called on during the meetings to provide public input during uh, an agenda item, Again, please insert your name and address in the chat and you will be called on during the rel relevant time for the public input. You will be given five minutes to speak during the public input. For citizens that wish to speak during the privilege of the floor at the end, please insert the following into the chat, which is your name and your address, and at the time that we have privilege of the floor and the council president will call on you and you will be given three minutes to speak during the privilege of the floor. Please be sure to unmute yourself prior to giving your remarks. Uh, thank you. Also, disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech and or actions, as well as verbal attacks on any person, may result in the individual without notice forfeiting, forfeiting the remainder of his or her allotted time. This time we're going to proceed with the invocation. Our invocation will be given by spiritual director Mike Cothlington from Hope Mission. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? See, I don't know if he's on. I believe I've seen him on here. Okay. He needs to unmute himself now. Could you unmute yourself, please? Mr. Hodling, could you unmute yourself for the invocation? This happened before when I couldn't get in, so remind me to move to come on in. So he's not on? Pastor Lee, evidently he is not able to get on from what Clerk Jones is saying. Would you mind providing an invocation for us this evening? Sure. Bow your heads. Be gracious, gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to do the business of the, of the city. We ask, God, that you would be with us, that you would order our steps, that you would guide our minds, help us to walk in unity, fairness, and equity for everyone in our community. We're so grateful, God, to have the Washington High School uh, state champions in the building with us today. And we just ask, God, that you would bless these young ladies to do incredible things in their lives and that they continue to go higher in everything that they ende endeavor to do. We thank you for the state legislators that are here today and all of the officials that are here today. And we just ask, God, that you would look over our city, that you will bless it and that you would allow South Bend to be the great city of peace that it was founded on. All these things we ask in your son's name, amen. Amen. If you'll please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance.
Thank you. Clerk Jones, could you call the roll, please? Yes. Council Member Davis? Henry's here. Council Member Lee? Present. Council Member <coughs> Warner? Present. Council Member Wax? Present. Council Member White? Present. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Present. Council Member Hammond? Council Member Hammond? I'm here, but I cannot hear you all. Okay, is, is this Council Member Hammond? Okay, that's President McBride. Right, and that was President McBride and Vice President Muskowski. Present. Okay, so right now I have eight present because I don't know if Council Member Hammond is online. I do not see her. Can you hear us now, President McBride? At this time, we're going to have a report from the subcommittee on the minutes from February 28th. Report of subcommittee on minutes to the Common Council of the City of South Bend. The subcommittee has inspected the minutes of the February 28th, 2022 meeting and found them to be correct. Therefore, we recommend the same be approved. I would like to make a motion to accept the report from the subcommittee on minutes for the February. I'm trying to log in on another device. I see the information, but I cannot. So I'm trying to log in. I can watch out vehicle and shoulder. I would like to um, make a motion to accept the report from the subcommittee on minutes for the February 28th, 2022 meeting. I will second that motion. Okay, there's been a vote and it's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is it appropriate to take an all voice for this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to special business. Um, we have a special, I think, uh, did you change your discussion? Yes, I'm sorry, Clerk Jones. We do have a special business for a special resolution. Could you please read that for us? Yes. Okay. 2214, 20, a special resolution awarded by the South Bend Common Council honoring the South Bend Washington Lady Panthers high school basketball team for its success in the 2021 2022 basketball season and in the Indiana State Basketball Tournament and a special presentation from the Indiana General Assembly local representatives honoring the Washington High School women's basketball team. And do we have a presenter? Yes, you have a presenter. I'm sorry. We just had some, um, she brought me some more paperwork and I uh, had no idea that we had more. Uh, so she's getting it straight. I think she's a bit frustrated with me, but I asked questions. Sorry. Um, good after Google. Good evening, folks. And uh, good, good evening to everyone that's here. Um, I'm going to ask that all of the Washington administrators and uh, the girls basketball team and coaches uh, would you uh, please come and join me during the reading of this um, this resolution 49 49 22 and if you could s state your name and address for the record i will <laughs> thank you but you should know that i'm just checking <laughs> We got everybody up here? Great. Oh, Mr. Cummings is here as well, Dr. Cummings. I didn't see, you snuck in the door. 
<laughs> so good. A special rec resolution awarded by the South Bend Common Council honoring the South Bend Washington Lady Panthers high school basketball team for its success in 2021-22 basketball season and in the Indiana State Basketball Tournament. Whereas in March 2020-21, the South Bend Common Council issued a special proclamation honoring the Lady Panther basketball team for success in the 2020-2021 basketball season and in the state of the Indiana State Basketball Tournament. And whereas the special proclamation stated, in part, the next year's team returns many of the same players to continue in the footsteps of the 2020-2021 team to build on the rock solid foundation and whereas the special proclamation that was prophetic because it was not only did the this year's team build upon the foundation it exceeded the many accomplishments of the last year's team by being ranked first in the state is ranked 20 to 22nd nationally and by winning the class indiana class 3a state championship by scoring in a class 3A state record of 93 points. And whereas the 2021-2022 South Bend Washington Lady Panther basketball team consists of the following individuals. Senior Shamara Allen, Mila Reynolds, Lauren Gillian, Gillen, and, I'm sorry, did I say that wrong? No, you said right. Okay. And juniors, Amaya Reynolds, Rashonda Jones, and freshman Raya Wilson, Jemiah Parhams, Kyra, Kira, thank you, Kira Reynolds, and Monique Mitchell. And whereas the team is coached by head coach Steve Reynolds Jr. and assistant coach Marcy Reynolds, together with Karis Phillips, Kenneth Hunt, and Eddie Clay, and whereas the team averaged its loss, averaged its loss in last year's state championship game by dominating Silver Creek by the score of 93 to 35. And whereas the Common Council proclaimed last year and now proclaims again next year's team returned many of the same players to continue in the footsteps of this team and to build on that rock solid foundation. Now therefore let it it, let it be publicly proudly proclaimed as follows, section one. On behalf of the citizens of South Bend and the South Bend Common Council, we are proud to again publicly recognize and congratulate the South Bend Washington High School Lady Panthers basketball team for its outstanding season. Section two, we wish in honor of each and every one of these young ladies, young women, as the great athletes that they are and wish them all continued success in the remainder of their educational years, be it at high school or college level, both on the court and off the court, and in the future careers where they will continue to do great things throughout their entire lives. Motivated by the experiences and successes that they have had this season, sign and approve this 14th day of March, 2022, in the city of South Bend, County of St. Joseph, and in the state of Indiana. You have um, a proclamation, I mean, excuse me, a resolution that comes to each of you, every one of you signed by every council member. Council, do you have, back to you. Thank you, and for the record, your name and address, please. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Davis, Jr., uh, 5117, Idaho Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46619. Thank you so much. You're Council, welcome. Council members, do you have any comments for these young, wonderful young ladies that are before us? Councilman Lee. I'll start it off. Um, watching you guys play was, was absolutely amazing and watching throughout your season. Uh, these are great moments, great days. I remember last year you guys came and you were so disappointed, but you guys took that disappointment and y'all went back to Indianapolis with a vengeance and my goodness, 93 to 35, <laughs> that's how you do it. That's how you dominate. So I am so grateful 
to see, uh, see you young girls excel and do well. We've had many times throughout these last four years of things not being well at Washington, and, but, to, but to celebrate you guys and to, to champion you all and to wish you all higher and greater things is it, so great and so rewarding. So I want to tell you, you guys are the pride of the West Side and you have made South Bend, you carried South Bend on your shoulders and you delivered. Councilman Wax. Thank you. I don't think I could uh, come after uh, Pastor Lee, but, uh, <laughs> just Councilman Lee with uh, such great words, but congratulations uh, and I wish you unbelievable success. Uh, you should build on this success and everything that you do, whether academic, whether uh, you know, on the basketball court, um, in your careers and everything you do in life. You should go from one success to another. Congratulations. Councilman Warner. Uh, thank you. I, I will also say congratulations. Very excited to celebrate you. Um, job well done. I'm, I'm gonna throw down a challenge though. You guys are leaders and mentors. Uh, whether you know it or not, you've inspired people in the community. They've been excited and energized by you. Um, I, I'm going to challenge you to keep that up. Our city needs young, energized, inspired leadership, and you guys are that next generation. So uh, I look forward to seeing all the great things you do uh, in the years to come. Councilwoman Tomas Morgan. Thank you, Chair. I just want to add to everyone else's congratulations. You make us proud. You make your school proud, the corporation proud, our city and our state. Thank you so much for the example that you set, not just on the court, but off the court. And can't wait to see what the future holds for you all. Thanks. Councilwoman Karen White. I don't know what else I can say. You know, my last name is White, and usually when I was in high school, I was the last person that they called on because they went by the alphabet. <laughs> but um, so much has been said, and I cannot tell you the pride that you have instilled, not only within the city of South Bend, but those young girls, they want to be just like you. And that is a, um, a major responsibility as you continue to move forward, knowing that you have others that are looking up to you. But I have no doubt that you are ready to take on that responsibility. You have made us so, so proud, not only uh, playing basketball, but you are solid academically. And so indeed, you are the pride of the West Side. And I can't wait to next year. And I do plan to uh, bring my um, girls from Raleigh High School so that they can see you in action. Again, congratulations, congratulations, and continue the hard work. Thank you. President McBride. Thank you. Hello, ladies and coaching staff. I wish I was there, and I just want to say congratulations to you all. I am so proud of you and the character building that the uh, Coach Reynolds and Coach Marcy and the staff does with you ladies. I know that they put their heart and soul in making sure that you succeed on and off the court and um, as young women and now I'm coming into adulthood. So I am so proud of what you have done for our city uh, last year and this year and the years to come. And congratulations, you have made us all proud. Thank you so much. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you President McBride. Um, and I would just like to say the same, uh, echo my colleagues here about how proud we are of the young ladies there, academically, on the court. I mean, you crushed it down there. <laughs> you smashed it, crushed it. Um, it was amazing. Um, and you are our leaders of tomorrow, and there are so many young ladies that look up to you. And for me, personally, as a woman, um, women leadership is so important, and know that your voice matters. And you're just a wonderful, phenomenal uh, team and I, I wish you all the best as you move forward with your life to the next level where it's academically a trade whatever you do I know it's going to be wonderful Councilman Davis would you like to have any last words yeah after we hear from the coaches and also the administration and the folks that came in from South Bend schools I'll, I'll be able to close out at that point okay thank you coach you have some words
Coach uh, Stephen Reynolds, Jr., 1109 Sylvan Lane, South Bend, Indiana, 46619. Um, thank you all uh, for having us back again. Uh, we don't take this lightly. Uh, we're very grateful for the opportunity to stand before you uh, and appreciate your support, your recognition. Um, it's been a, a long haul um, over these years, uh, being a coach for 10 years total at Washington. Um, I can say that um, I am proud that this is the fruit uh, of my labor. Um, these young ladies are my, my legacy. And uh, thank you for administration and leadership who have continually been supportive, uh, on time, on the money, whatever you want to say. Uh, I just want to take this time again to thank you all uh, for being there for us uh, time and time again uh, when we've needed you. Um, but again, just thank you. Uh, we are looking forward uh, to doing this again uh, with support, with your, uh, with your help. Um, and go Panthers, ever onward. Thomas Sims, uh, 53005 Fernwood Drive, South Bend, Indiana, uh, Princeton Washington High School. We want to say thank you again for the recognition of our outstanding young ladies here. Um, our Lady Panthers are the most phenomenal students in our building. Um, people sometimes recognize Washington differently because of past, but I can tell you what they have done have brought us into the limelight, not only Washington, but South Bend schools. And I am so proud of everything that they've accomplished. Their, their dreams have just begun, and I'm excited to see where it takes them as well. So on behalf of Washington High School's administrative team, thank you all for this recognition. We are so very proud and continue to watch these young ladies. They're not done yet. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. My name is Todd Cummings. I'm the superintendent of South Bend Schools, 215 South Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard, South Bend, Indiana. I want to say that I am thrilled to represent the best girls basketball team in the state of Indiana. Yes. Thank you to their coach, Mr. Steve Reynolds. Yep. Thank you to their coach, Mr. Steve Reynolds. Congratulations to the ladies. Thank you, Mr. Tom Sims. I specifically want to thank my board of school trustees. But specifically, I want to thank you. Thank you for your support, not only of South Bend Schools, but of Washington. So we really appreciate the accolades tonight. President McBride, thank you. Council Davis, thank you. And to all council members, thank you so much for recognizing our ladies. Thank you. Is there anybody else there that would like to make a comment from the coaching staff or the Uh, absolutely, and thank you so much, Council. Um, any, any player on the team want to have anything to say? <laughs> Come on. No, I, I'm being serious, because see, what happens is that this thank you thing is really exhausting, right? Everybody wants to say thank you. You got to show up here, show up there. So we never hear from the players, so nothing. That's fine. I got it. Hey, um, what, what, what's, what's, what's awesome uh, 2007, I was elected into office, and um, right after that, that's when we began to see um, um, the maturation of what looks like a legacy of winning on the west side of Indiana, on the west side of South Bend. And we recognized that this school was not only necessary, but the things that went on inside of the, uh, the four walls was also necessary. Uh, we are... Um, widely and wildly um, uh, expecting of success on the west side of South Bend. Uh, we know that we have it, we honor it, and we do the best that we can with what we have to make sure it continues on its legacy. Um, although we do talk about this being a second district thing or, or Washington thing or pride of the west side, this is the pride of South Bend. Um, we don't have this often. Well, actually we do with you guys. We, we don't have this often. We haven't had it as often. And the only way that we continue this legacy of winning um, through academics and through athletics is that this school stays a viable entity within the city of South Bend. We have to make sure that this school gets what it deserves. Uh, population uh, attendance and also the support from community partners. 
and only when and only then we can say that we are the pride of South Bend and definitely the pride of the West Side. So council members, um, one thing, two things. The first thing is that I want you to obviously accept this uh, by full affirmation. I, I, I was expect that that's what will happen today. The other thing is that, and I want to say this out loud, and I think our state reps, our state folks can help us out with this. At, this, at the city gates, we need to see a sign that says, South Bend Washington High School Lady Panthers uh, state champions. So we need to work on how that is going to look. Seriously, that's a great thing. I think when, um, not, I don't think anything, when Clay High School won the last all class uh, uh, state championship, we got to see that as a realization. We need to see that as well. Uh, we can't ignore what has happened and what has occurred over the last 15 years. This is some awesome stuff. And so again, thank you so much for allowing me my time and the time with the, uh, the team and the school corporation. And um, back to you, Council President. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't believe there's a vote on a special resolution, is there? Or should I just uh, do a ceremonial vote? All those in favor of these wonderful young ladies in this resolution, say aye. 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 Well, actually, uh, Vice President Nitskowski, you, you do need to have public comment. Anyone speaking oh. for or against? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's a resolution. So is there anyone here wishing or on um, teams that would like to speak in favor of resolution 22-14? Is there anyone wishing to speak against special um, res uh, the resolution 22-14. Okay, let me check virtually. I don't see anybody on there, but maybe I'm missing somebody. No, these people are saying congratulations on the chat, okay. so. They're, they're aware, they're just congratulating you. <laughs> okay, I don't see then anybody wishing to speak against, in favor or against. So I will come back to the council. I would like to entertain a motion to accept resolution 22-14. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> the motion is passed. <laughs> Lady Panthers, if, um, and ladies, if you could still, if you could oh, stay where you're at, because right we're going to have the, okay. the state legislators right. come up because they have a special presentation for All you right. as well. I'm David Nesgotsky, state senator of District 10, and I reside at 4942 Scenic Drive, South Bend, and it is my uh, uh, honorable council members. Uh, esteemed championship virtuals, mm -hmm. uh, players, Lady Panthers, administrators from Washington High School, and Superintendent uh, Dr. Uh, Cummings. It's my distinct pleasure and honor tonight, along with Senator Linda, Linda Rogers, Representative Maureen Bauer, and Representative Jake Teshka to present this uh, resolution from the state of Indiana to you. So on behalf of the Indiana General Assembly, this is Senate Concurrent Resolution 45. This is a concurrent resolution honoring the Washington High School girls basketball team on winning the IHSAA 3A8 or 3A championship. Whereas for the first time since 2007, the Washington High School girls basketball team are state champions. Whereas Washington used a record setting effort to knock out defending state champion Silver Creek 93-35 in the Class 3A state title game in Gamebridge Fieldhouse. And whereas Panthers, the Panthers set a 3A record with their 93 points. And now we'll go to Senator Linda Rogers. Well, thank you. I'm Senator Linda Rogers, and I live at 50563 Chestnut Road in Granger. And I'm thrilled to be here and congratulate all these amazing women on their championship. And continuing with our resolution, the nationally ranked Panthers are the 22nd best girls basketball team in America, according to the latest ESPN poll. 
whereas Myla Reynolds scored 21 points and Kira Reynolds added another 17 points in a title game record 24 rebounds on Saturday, February 25th, 2022, inside Gamebridge Fieldhouse. Thank you, Maureen Bauer, 1307 Sunnymead Avenue, South Bend, Indiana, 46615. Whereas the Panthers dominated the rematch of last year's title game from start to finish, including a 27 to zero run in the second period to take a 51-16 lead into the locker room at halftime. Whereas Washington's Rashonda Jones added 17 points, Monique Mitchell scored 14 for the Panthers, and Amaya Reynolds tallied eight points. And whereas the Panthers finished the game shooting 53% from the field and 38.9% from three point range. Jake Teshka, 2419 Cheshire Drive, South Bend. Therefore, be it resolved by the Senate of the General Assembly of the State of Indiana, the House of Representatives concurring, Section 1, that the Indiana General Assembly honors the Washington High School girls basketball team on winning the IHSAA 3A championship. Section 2, that the Secretary of the Senate is hereby directed to transmit copies of this resolution to each member of the Washington High School girls basketball team, adopted by voice vote this third day of March, 2022. Congratulations, Jim. We have had the chance to hear from uh, the administrators and uh, Dr. Cummings, and uh, if any of the girls would like to say anything, but seriously, uh, Councilman Davis said it very well. Uh, ladies, you are not only the pride of the West Side, you are the pride of the city of South Bend, and it is our distinct honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight. Thank you, let's do this again next year. And at this time, um, if we could, um, I think we're going to recess for a minute so we can get a couple pictures with the championship team. So at this time, we're going to recess for five minutes.
Yeah. Just say that we convene the council hall and uh, close the report from city office. Okay, so we're going to reconvene at this time. Um, and now we're going to go to the reports from city offices. An update from Innovation and Technology, Denise Rydell and Dave Finney, I believe. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm David Finley. I'm the city's director of business analytics, uh, 1093 Woodward Avenue in South Bend. Um, I uh, know Denise is joining us virtually, uh, but we'll go ahead and get things started. But she's also here if you have any questions. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to walk you through the cities of uh, our transparency hub, which is an online resource for residents and also city uh, elected officials. And uh, it should take about 20 minutes or so. The uh, uh, kind of different things we'll be talking about are showing uh, the why of why do we focus on public transparency for the city and why do we use it as a performance management tool, while also uh, walking through uh, some of the da key dashboards that we have on the website and taking a moment to kind of just say, here's what's there, um, here's kind of basic information you can find. Um, and yes, this is not going to be as cool of a presentation as we, we just saw, um, but uh, we're, we're here, we're going to give it a try. Um, so yeah, the focus of this slide deck that we've prepared um, is to uh, just walk through transparency and performance, which is a specific service that the city offers. We'll then walk through um, different hub uh, and public dashboards that we have available. And then finally, we do have uh, some small components focusing on how residents can get involved and how residents can take action in uh, changing some of these tools or thinking about how can we add to this resource. Um, so I'll be starting just kind of with the basics of where you can find this information, um, the different components that make up this city service, so the kind of different uh, pieces to the pie for public transparency, and then also uh, focus on how we measure success and some relevant awards and benchmarks that the city focuses on. Uh, so where is the city's transparency hub? Uh, the uh, screenshot you see on the, scr on the screen right now is just the City of South Bend website. Um, so if you hover over the I'm looking for tab at the top of the page, um, you will, uh, so I've highlighted it right here, and then there's just a button that says transparency and performance, and that takes you to the transparency hub. What is on here? Uh, we have a lot of resources focused on city performance management, so that is for our SB STAT program. Then we have city fo uh, resources focused on our city data, so our online open data platform. Then we have our transparency hub, where the bulk of our time will be spent tonight, where we have city dashboards and analytics. And then lastly, SBUX, or user experience, which is that resident engagement component. Uh, so this will be a kind of a process map for how we make city data accessible and meaningful. So I'll walk you through it for a moment. Uh, just because data, at least, um, at least to me, can be kind of an academic or uh, it's abstract concept, and so I'm trying to break it down a bit here. Um, so we start for public transparency, transparency in South Bend with just collecting data. So this is about data we collect in our city staff collect in our GIS servers, um, data that's collected through forms and processes and, and government protocols. Um, we then go through a data governance process, and if it's um, able to be publicly available, we put it on our open data portal. So that's kind of the first central component. So this is something I'll walk through, but where you can download data from. Um, our next step of this tool is our reports and dashboards. So we have uh, dashboards that we make available that is kind of a curated look that are designed either with residents or with city leadership to say, here uh, we have all of our data available on the open data portal. Here's what we see as key performance measures or trends to be paying attention to when it comes to this data. Um, and then finally, we co-design some um, work with our uh, SBUX program, specifically kind of creating dashboards for neighborhood reports and neighborhood associations. Um, so what does success look like? I just wanted to share, um, because it's kind of a high-level topic and subject matter, 
Um, there are awards that the city has received um, from What Works Cities, which is Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, we recently received our civil silver certification for 2021, just uh, last month maybe, um, and also an ICMA certificate of distinction. And what this chart is here, I'm not gonna walk through it. I don't expect you to be able to read it, but I just wanna show, and if you have questions, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, this chart shows of cities who applied for What Works Cities certification, uh, how far the city average for all the cities that apply are in said benchmark area and then where the city of South Bend is. And so we are the, um, the red bars there. So you can see we're able to measure our success by basically focusing how are we doing in performance management and data efforts compared to our peers. Um, and then just some highlights for some summary numbers on our open data portal. We have 86 publicly available data sets. Um, on our transparency hub, we have seven enterprise dashboards, um, which uh, recounting police transparency is just one in that number. So we have a couple of sub uh, dashboards related to police transparency. Um, from our resident engagement, we have, uh, and here let me get rid of this over here, um, over 1,300 data points from qualitative research, research that's interviews with residents or focus groups with residents, um, and then 830 resident engagements, uh, 838 resident engagements in 2021. Um, so now I'm just gonna walk through the different components that make up our transparency hub. Uh, one thing, um, so just to focus and get started, um, we're focusing on this part of the process. So just the open data portal, what is publicly available for any resident or anyone to go visit and download city data from. Uh, we do have a user guide for getting started. Um, so we do have just a page on the website and I'll actually back out of my presentation right here and load it up. Uh, here is our open data portal. Um, and as it loads, you can see, you can search city data sets, but then if you scroll down, there's a user guide right here, and that just lets residents know how they can get started. Um, but you're able to search city data sets just by typing in things like 311, surveys, police. Um, we also have data kind of high level categories coming down from below, so those are also available. And then just to highlight the system here, like all of our, uh, our data sets on here, um, our online dashboards are powered by open data. So um, like what is listed here is just an example of this use of force incidents table is the reference point for our dashboard focusing on um, crime and crime incidents. Um, I will move uh, to the next step, which is kind of walking through some different reports and dashboards we have available. So this is where we have the, the bulk of my presentation is gonna focus. Um, we also do have kind of paper-based reports that we're able to develop um, off of this. You can find that if you're interested in the performance management section of the Transparency Hub. Um, and so this will be, I'm walking through some resources you may have seen before, but I'm gonna be talking about some things that are new, but also why these are the dashboards we uh, maintain and keep up to date because they relate to citywide enterprise performance management. So specifically things like spending, um, city spending, um, things like resident perceptions and priorities. So that's a dashboard of our community survey of which we'll be having another one this year, which is statistically valid data on resident opinion. Um, and also city 311 and requests for service. So really thinking about from an intake perspective, what is um, what are residents calling about? What are they requesting for service? And how do we respond to that? Um, and then I also, if these are familiar, I also do have some kind of uh, uh, what's next. That'll be a, some sneak peeks of things that should be new for you. Um, so just to orient you for a moment to some of our public dashboards, this is, um, here I guess I'll just say, this is coming from the Transparency Hub. These are the seven enterprise dashboards I was referring to. So each of these icons will take you to one of these tools. Um, and then to blow up our city spending uh, dashboard, this is our financial transparency dashboard that um, the Innovation and Technology Department made in collaboration with the Administration and Finance Department. And so what this is showing is spending over time. Um, specifically, what this is showing right now is for fis this current fiscal year. Um, the reason this may, so this is gets updated daily and our dashboards are updated daily if data is collected on a daily basis. 
Um, and so this is, you'll see, uh, this is January, if you follow my cursor, January, February, March. March, as we get towards the end of the month, will continue to grow as a bar uh, as the city spends more money and the, the month winds down. Winds down. Um, we also have the ability to go back to look at different fiscal years with this tool. So you're able to look at all of this data um, by for the past four years. Um, you're also able to search by department, and so that's what most of our dashboards have, and you'll typically find it in this top right corner of searching by department. I always like to pick on uh, the department I'm in. So now I've filtered the data, so we're just looking at city spending for innovation and technology. Um, you have, if you are a kind of a power user, or you would be interested in like, okay, yes, big numbers are nice, like what did the city actually spend money on? Uh, you can click on this button and there's more detail that is specifically calling out uh, different types of um, buckets of uh, funding that we spend money on. We also show the vendors we're giving money to. Um, you're able to adjust this by date as well, so if you wanna look at different time frames, you can. Um, and then we also have the transaction level data. I know Dan Parker really particularly likes this page, which is to say this is our open city checkbook. This is showing every check that the city has um, uh, given to a vendor and paid a vendor with, and you're able to kind of have some of those searchable functions here too. Um, the next uh, dashboard I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, and let me, I'm just kind of timing myself so I don't get too excited about showing any of these things and spend too long of a time on them. But this is our city uh, community survey dashboard. Um, so this is visualizing the results. This is a, a presentation and a report that was shared with you all that shows uh, residents' um, opinions over time. So we've been doing this since 2018. So you're able to see how resident opinions on certain service areas or topics has fluctuated over time. You're also able to break it down by income level. So you're able to see things like what do different income brackets think about different city services, things like that. Um, the page that I always like to, and you can see some of that on this demographics button, which uh, will show you age um, and uh, race, demographics, the page I'll just briefly touch on and, and show for a moment is the uh, maps. And I just like this one because A, and it might be particularly applicable to you all, it breaks resident satisfaction data down by council district. So that chart in the bottom left, that is showing um, resident satisfaction for certain questions on this survey by council district. And so you can see the disparity, um, or um, perhaps like more interestingly, the the uh, lack of disparity that we have in some of our city services and how people are satisfied with them. Uh, so I just point you to this page if you're wanting to check it out. Um, and then lastly, our customer service dashboard. This is our last like city performance um, enterprise-wide uh, performance management dashboard where it's focused on intake that the city is receiving for requests for service and call center. Um, info, you're able to break it down by the past 30 days. So this is just looking at the past 30 days worth of data. Um, we're also able to look at this year. Uh, so everything that's happened so far this year. But then finally, uh, we have all data, which is an overwhelming amount of data points. It go, but it doesn't go, it's, it's a little misleading. It goes back to the start of 2018 when we have first kind of using the current software system. And there is a note that says that part. Um, yeah, but it's just showing the location of different service requests and you're able to search by department again in the top right corner here. Um, and you're able to see the top five call topics. Public Works, I think I saw, I don't know if Eric is still on the line, but I saw Eric Horvath online earlier. Public Works gets the majority of these service requests. So really it's focused largely for the most part on solid waste and um, our utility de department. Um, we also have a few dashboards focused on uh, basically what I, I see as city strategy or priority areas. And so the couple ones I just wanna draw attention to are police transparency and street conditions. Um, so police transparency is something that um, our uh, operations manager, Kelsey Lang, as a member of our innovation technology department is able to maintain for the city um, and works very closely with Chief Griskowski on maintaining it. And so the main one I wanna highlight tonight, this is the transparency hub for police. So again, this is just clicking off that button icon that says police transparency. Um, but you're able to scroll down, and the one I like to focus on is the crime and incidents data. Uh, this is something you don't see in most cities in terms of um, the level of transparency being shown here. 
as I try to uh, maximize it here. Um, what I'll be showing here is incident map and crime trends over time. And so this dashboard uh, is updated weekly, and so it's showing part one crimes over the past 30 days as they come in. So that's what this incident map is breaking down. Um, so you're able to see where the crimes are taking place. You're able to zoom in and zoom out to get more information about uh, part one crime if you'd like. You're able to search by different types. Um, you're able to see like incident level detail. That's what's here on the right. And you're also able to see from a, like a heat map perspective, when are these crimes happening according to police data. Um, again, I wouldn't expect the average resident to be necessarily that interested in some of the fancy whistles that are on this, um, but for power user standpoint or people particularly interested in this subject, this is what we can share as a resource or what you can point people to. Also, this is some of the data that'll get shared um, with any universities that we're partnering with to perform research questions on some of the uh, uh, crime uh, trends we're looking at. Um, the next one I wanted to highlight is our street conditions dashboard. Um, so this is something that was launched as a part of our uh, rebuilding our streets plan uh, that was shared last year. And so this is a tool that we're now using to track street conditions and how they improve over time. Um, so you're able to actually go, this is uh, the public works methodology for what, how we use, um, how we measure success for street quality. And so this is an average PACER score, which is a number out of 10. If you actually um, hover over this, it tells you more information about how this is like a academic but um, national type of measuring tool. And here I'll make this bigger for you all. Um, the cool thing that I like to do with this particular dashboard is you are able to search by street name. So I talked about where I live earlier. Um, I can just type in my street name and I'm able to zero in on that. And so you see the data really focus on that. Um, so that's just an example of how you can get really granular with these types of tools, but also how you can um, look at the high level metrics. Um, for more other kind of special topics or strategy areas we look into, it'll be on our SB stat um, area of our transparency portal. So that is focused on its our performance management section of that. Uh, that web page. So as far as what's next, um, I'll talk about a little bit for customer service. I'm also be talking about um, a dashboard that we'll be sharing um, and, and shaping and molding with the um, IPC board uh, for city spending to minority and or women owned businesses and that's built off of our financial transparency uh, portal. Um, and then also a fire operations dashboard that we're working closely with Chief Buchanan in development. Again, um, we're, I'm sharing those, these things to show you what's uh, upcoming, but uh, they are subject to change at this point as we kind of dot um, our I's and cross our T's with them. Um, one thing I wanted to say at, uh, at our report out for the Innovation Technology Department, Denise shared how we completed service level agreements for all of our services over the past year. What we, um, they're kind of called performance measures um, in a like more broader sense, but like things um, we, we specifically say, here's the number of hours I think it'll take my staff or my team to complete this service. Um, and so as a part of that, what we're going to be doing with that data is taking it to refine our customer service dashboard. So right now it's just focused on information coming in for residents. We'll also be showing um, information coming out from departments, how fast are we doing these service requests and are we being completed on target, so, uh, so to speak. So that's something that's on the way that I wanted to highlight. The um, next thing I wanted to highlight, which I, I have this kind of fun uh, thing I drew up here just to kind of uh, cross, uh, cover my bases here, but this is our minority and or women owned business dashboard prototype. And so you'll see it looks very familiar in the sense that it's, it's matched a lot like our financial transparency portal, but it'll be focused just on city spending to minority and or women owned businesses. Um, so this is something we're shaping with the IPC board and we'll be talking about um, next month, I believe. Uh, but you're able to kind of really break it down and have that same level of, of dynamic search and view for looking at um, spending to minority and or women owned businesses. Um, and then the fire operations dashboard is again subject to change, 
but is modeled a lot after our police transparency work. We're able to see when are our calls coming in. You're able to see our response time to each call. You'd be able to drill down to focus on uh, kind of response times to certain parts of town. So like are, are we having equitable and consistent response times um, and um, just the total volume, which can be a lot. Uh, and this will include fire calls, but also false alarm calls and medical calls. Um, and then lastly, just to focus on some examples of city engagement. So that's kind of like where we really, these are a bunch of fun numbers and we can uh, make them useful tools that are focused on key performance managers to measures to track progress over time or to see how the city is doing. What do residents actually want to learn about? What are the, in, the metrics that they're interested in? Um, some of the efforts we've done over the past year in that, which kind of contributed some of those data points we talked about at the beginning of this slide deck, um, are the build the budget project, but also a lot of work with um, ideation sessions with the community. So we worked with Bloomberg Philanthropies at the start of last year, thinking about how can we help uh, residents who are struggling to pay their utility bill and really gathering, um, you know, we have a lot of high-minded, very quantitative data. What is the quality? What is the human experience that makes up these services? And how can we use that information to make better services and uh, complement some of the more quantitative metrics and tools that we have? Oh, and the last one is kind of what we're testing out this year. So this is something we're working on with um, in focus, but also a neighborhood association that we're hoping to scale if it goes well, um, is we're working with a, a specific neighborhood association reached out to in focus, which reached out to the city to make a custom report specifically for the neighborhood association. So a similar report, but focused on a particular neighborhood. And we can do a lot of that because we have these citywide enterprise dashboards that it's not very hard to just take that report and then just focus on a specific place. So that's something we're building with um, a neighborhood association. We also have a neighborhood map that we're building reports with neighborhood associations, specifically in LaSalle. Um, but I just wanted to share this, that we're something we're kind of working directly with residents to figure out what people want to see and provide them that information. Um, and just as like a, a general feedback loop tool, uh, we have um, forms on all of these dashboards where you say if you want to give feedback or we also have a form on our open data portal if you want to ask for more information, um, you're able to click that and able to take it, answer it on your phone or answer it on your desktop and give that uh, feedback to us. Um, so that's my walkthrough of our transparency portal and our process. Um, I think uh, I actually want to take a moment to thank you all for your commitment to public transparency. You saw in some of those charts at the outset of this presentation, the city of South Bend is far and ahead a lot of its peers, um, and particularly like that, uh, that chart includes cities of all populations and sizes. So particularly for a city of our size, I want to thank you all for our commitment to public transparency. Uh, any questions for me before we break? Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, council members, do you have any questions for Mr. Finley? Mr. Finley? Yeah. How, how do you guys decide what goes on the transparency page? It's uh, typically a, um, it's a combination of what data we have available and then also what, uh, what are our priorities from the mayor. So we work closely with the mayor's office through our SB STAT program. And so a lot of these dashboards come out of the emphasis that the mayor's office sets for our, the agenda for those meetings. So like a very good example would be um, the street conditions dashboard. So because that was a priority area last year and as a, to complement that plan, that was something we spent um, time and energy on. That said, um, it's, it's, so it's we're responsive to mayoral priorities while also focusing on like what are the basics of government that are important to be sharing. So like at what I spent at the beginning to focus on city spending, intake of people, requests for service, things like that. And you guys have where you, we can give input or the residents can give input. How, how, how many residents actually engage in that? In and, and giving a response on 
So we, we've, had, uh, we've had project focus, like SBUX sessions or user experience sessions. sections. So what I mean by that is we haven't, uh, we, ha we have done some events where it's been like, what feedback do you have for us on our police transparency hub? So that was something we did um, in 2020, um, but also then last year, like specifically thinking about build the budget or our utility bills um, resident engagement. We also did work with um, lead and behavioral insights. We've had project focused feedback, uh, but we don't have, we don't have, an, uh, we haven't done an event where it's uh, like a broader, what do you want to know about city analytics? Cause uh, I guess, my mindset is I try trying to meet people where they are, where that can be kind of like a high level question. So we really go to issues that we are hearing people are caring about. Any other council member? Um, okay, council member Tomas Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Finley, thank you so much for this presentation. It's amazing information um, that you were able to give an overview and a refresh for us all about, um, I'm consistently amazed at the, the work that your, um, that the department does and uh, wanna thank you for that. I, my question was in terms of, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into creating these dashboards and I know you've, um, your de department has been responsive to many of us on council um, asking for reports, et cetera. What is what does the traffic look like um, on these dashboards um, from residents from citizens? There's typically a big bump when there is a, a press release like related to okay. a specific dashboard that directs people there. So, for example, the um, quarterly public safety updates that the mayor and uh, chief started this year, we. Um, a, as that went out, when we direct people to our police transparency resources, we typically see a bump in activity. But for the large part, it's not something that residents engage with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And in what ways, uh, and my second question is, in what ways can the council help to push out some of this information? What would be some suggestions you have for us? Uh, I, th I think one thing uh, that would make sense is keeping, um, <coughs> our team abreast on like the, the heartbeat of the city. And so what I mean by that are like, what are the pressing topics? What are the things that you are hearing that uh, residents care about that you feel like there's maybe a lack of data or facts or evidence around um, and work with Denise and, and reach out with her to see if we can create tools to build data or frameworks around that. Like I know, um, uh, like Clerk Jones and I, for example, maybe earlier this year, we're talking about different like custom reports we're making based on the type of inquiries her office is hearing. Um, so it can be just sitting down from a starting point and having a conversation with our chief innovation officer and uh, seeing what data we have available internally that we might just be able to lend to the, the issue or uh, what data we may need to start collecting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't see any other uh, members that would like to make a comment, so thank you so much for your presentation and all the work that you're doing for the you're residents welcome. and the city of South Bend. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, um, I will entertain a motion to resolve into the Committee of the Whole. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The Committee of the Whole is now in session. This is the portion of the Council's meeting where bills are given a second reading in public hearing. I wish to share with you that bills that will be given a second reading and public hearing have been given a first reading and set for a committee meeting and a public hearing prior to this evening's meeting. In addition, you will hear from the chairperson of the committee where the bill was discussed and the results of their discussion. If the proposed ordinance is a zoning ordinance, a report from a staff member will be given. In all other situations, the formal presentation on the proposed ordinance will immediately follow the committee report. The formal presentation shall be on time. 
and what we've been considering is Bill uh, 08-22. Clerk Jones, would you please give Bill 08-22 a second reading? Yes. 08-22, public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, appropriating additional funds for certain departmental and city services operations for the year 2022 of 183000 from the Law Enforcement Continuing Education Fund, number, two, number 220, $7,800,000 from the Local Income Tax Economic Development Fund, number 408, $180,000 from the Sewage Works Operating Fund, number 641, and 347697 from the Equipment Vehicle Leasing, number 750. Is there a committee report? Uh, yes, Chair. That was heard in the Personal and Finance Committee this uh, afternoon, and it was given a favorable recommendation to the Committee of the Whole. Is the petitioner president? I ask that you state your name and address and share with us key points regarding the bill that's before us. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Dan Parker, City Controller. My office is on the 12th floor of this building. Um, I will run through the brief presentation that we talked through in committee this afternoon um, and then be happy to uh, answer any questions that anybody has. Um, so Bill 822 is the second of what we call our normal quarterly budget adjustment bills. Uh, and the reason why this is the second is, and, and not the first is that we don't have the first one uh, this quarter. The first one we usually go through is budget transfers, um, but there were no budget transfers that were required this quarter. So we go straight into additional appropriation requests. Um, as we talked about in committee, uh, the bill itself is a request for an additional $8.5 million in appropriations. Of that $8.5 million, $7.8 million, so the vast majority, is related to the purchase and renovation of the South Bend Community School Corporation admin building uh, to become the, the new city hall. Um, so uh, just to expand on that opportunity a little bit, um, as we talked about, the purchase price of that building uh, or the currently is currently still being negotiated, um, but the, the high-level agreement that we have with the schools is th to purchase the building for $2.8 million. Uh, that is subject to change based on results of due diligence and those kinds of things, um, but that is the high-level agreement at this point. Um, the, the building itself is just under 65,000 square feet. Uh, in, tw in 2005, it underwent a $7.5 million renovation, um, and, and both the appraisal and the pricing analyses that we've seen um, have mentioned that the building's been well-maintained in the structural uh, elements, the HVAC systems, the roof, uh, those kinds of things have been well-maintained. Uh, and then also wanted to mention that uh, parking is always an issue when we talk about where administrative offices are going to be located. Uh, and one of the biggest benefits or biggest amenities that this building offers is uh, covered attached parking uh, for city employees, certainly, and then also additional parking lots uh, and parking garages within two blocks of the building. Um, so uh, as we'll see in just a second, one of the biggest benefits uh, of this opportunity is increased accessibility for, for city residents to come to meetings just like this one, um, where oftentimes we hear there's difficulties finding parking uh, to come into the county city building for these kinds of meetings. So on those benefits, uh, the, the most important one is, is uh, on the operational side and, and allowing for an increased efficiency and accessibility. Um, so we, uh, this would be an expansion of space for our current county city building workers. So I, I did put up the cur current square feet for the county city building plus the, the, what the new building would offer in terms of square footage. Uh, the, the line to look at there is the usable square feet line. Uh, that excludes things like the hallways and the mechanical rooms and the bathrooms and those kinds of things. That's just the office space uh, itself. Uh, and so you can see it's about a 50% increase in overall square footage, uh, which will be extremely helpful. Uh, the workers in this building are very tightly packed, especially on certain floors and the three and a half floors that we have. Um, so this will allow us to really design the building and have the, the, the footprint that we need in order to accommodate uh, the, the administrative workers in the city. Um, there's also an opportunity to consolidate certain city departments, uh, especially with the Waterworks Admin Building, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and then also the enhanced accessibility, like I just talked about, uh, for the public with respect to the garage and, and the parking lots near, nearby. And then one benefit that I know all council members will appreciate is the um, having a dedicated council chambers where uh, meetings can be scheduled and had there at any time without needing to schedule around an, another body. Uh, as we do currently in our space now. 
Uh, one thing that uh, also is important to keep in mind is that this is this is a opportunity is somewhat of a win-win for the city of South Bend and the school corporation. Um, the benefits to the South Bend Community School Corporation were summarized pretty nicely by uh, Chief Financial Officer Karima Fowler in her presentation to the school board back on January 24th. Um, really comes down to two items. One is uh, reducing it, uh, ongoing operational cost, uh, maintaining the building and uh, staffing the building, paying the, you know, keeping the lights on, paying the gas, all of those kinds of things, uh, which allows them to redirect that, that uh, current cost into investment in their classrooms. Uh, and then also just shrinking their capital asset profile to be more in line uh, with their current number of students. Uh, and again, not having to have the liability of having more and more buildings that then have to have roofs replaced and HVAC systems replaced and those kinds of things. So they expect a, an operational benefit as well as a financial benefit, um, as do we. So it's, it is, to a, to a large extent, a win-win for, for both entities here. And then on the financial side, uh, I did want to just dive a little bit deeper into the analysis of the costs and benefits here. So uh, what we are asking for tonight is a, a, an appropriation of the one-time costs, uh, which would be the purchase price of $2.8 million as it stands today. Um, and I did want to mention that that $2.8 million is in line with both the pricing analysis and the appraisal that the South Bend schools had done. Um, so we want to make sure that that appraisal is, uh, or that purchase price is in line with that appraisal. We're not paying too high, but also not, not undervaluing the building as well. And, and unfortunately, uh, the negotiated purchase price came in pretty close to that appraised value, which is great. Um, then on the renovation cost side, uh, we're, we're asking for $5 million for renovation costs. That would include both the architect agreement to design a space that would work for the city, uh, work for our employees, uh, as well as be a secure building um, that, and, a, and an accessible building for the public. So those would be the one-time costs, and then obviously there would be on, ongoing annual costs that we don't incur today to operate the building. So that's the cost of the utilities, uh, the cost of parking. So the school corporation does have an agreement with the city today to uh, provide parking for their employees. They lease 125 spaces from the, the Wayne Street parking garage, which is connected. Um, and that's about $80,000, $90,000 a year. Um, so we would absorb that cost as well. But it is important to note that that is a payment to ourselves. So we would be reimbursing the parking garages uh, from, from our income tax or our general fund for, for that cost. Uh, and then also things like custodial and maintenance uh, and, and upkeep and security. Um, we think based on numbers provided by the school corporation that that would uh, run about $400,000 annually. That's about what they, they, uh, they spend currently to uh, on ongoing annual operational costs for that building. So that $400,000 ongoing annual operational cost is offset uh, fully and, and then some by savings in uh, uh, vacating this current building. So on the, uh, for this current building in common area maintenance, we pay 26.5% roughly of all the costs that it takes to maintain this building. So uh, all of the electric water, uh, the security here, all of the cleaning services, everything, uh, we pay 26.5% of that. Over the past few years, you can see that that number's bounced around a little bit, but generally in the neighborhood of 600,000, maybe a little bit north of there in a normal year. Um, and in the 2022 budget, we expect it to be a little bit above $600,000. So that would be all savings that we would no longer have to incur those costs on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then also there's the, there's the opportunity, the potential opportunity to consolidate some of the uh, folks that work in Waterworks Administration over on 207 North Main Street. We currently rent that office space um, for about $60,000 annually, uh, and we could save that as well by consolidating those folks uh, into the new city hall. So uh, just to sum that up, you can see that the ongoing operational savings is roughly $675,000, uh, $670,000, as compared to ongoing costs of $400,000. So uh, about $275,000 uh, in, in ongoing benefit, uh, 250 to 275, um, which is off, which uh, will offset the $7.8 million one-time costs. Uh, the payback period there, if you do the quick math, is just over 20 years, which, which is generally seen as a pretty good payback period on these kinds of large-scale uh, capital investments. Some additional items to consider as, and, and some outstanding items as we're going through the negotiating proce process with the South Bend Community School Corporation. 
Um, the estimated renovation cost at $5 million does include high-level estimates for the uh, structural repairs and repair of the elevators. I know we mentioned in committee this afternoon that the elevators will certainly need to be replaced. Um, those are old, we know that. Um, but for all of the other uh, structural elements, the HVAC systems, the electrical systems, the plumbing systems, the roof, all of the fire and life safety systems, uh, we are going to have those evaluated through both our architect uh, engagement as well as through our engagement with an external consultant who is doing a facilities condition assessment for all of the city's facilities. Um, so we did add the, the, this building, the school's building, into the facilities condition assessment that was already ongoing. Um, and so that consultant will uh, evaluate those, those various structural items of, of the building and let us know where they're at in the life cycle and what might need to be replaced uh, in short order. Uh, we also know that based on conversations that a, a big topic uh, of conversation and, and wanting to make sure that we, we are planning for this is to have a full security plan. Uh, so the security assessment or, or a security assessment is planned to be part of the architect engagement. So that is something that they can subcontract out to security consultants um, who will look at the layout of the building and provide both recommendations on how to design the building to, uh, to accommodate a secure building, uh, like things like having one public access point and having key card access to, to, to various areas and those kinds of things, um, but also uh, provide recommendations on city policies that can help enhance security uh, in the new building as well. So uh, more to come on that, but that will be a, a very important part of the, of, of the architect agreement uh, is to have that full security assessment so that we can maintain the secure building and keep our employees safe. Uh, and then same thing on the space planning side. So in terms of who, which departments will go where within the new building, that's not something that's been decided yet, um, but that will be a, a very big important part of the uh, architect agreement and the architect engagement to assess the various departments and what is needed for each department uh, and what their space requirements are, and then designing an area and putting uh, different departments in different places within the building uh, to fit those needs. Just to give you an idea of where we stand in the process of, uh, of the, the sale and purchase of this building, uh, on January 24th, as I mentioned early, earlier, the um, South Bend Community School Corporation took the first public step um, to, in the process, which was to uh, pass a resolution indicating their intent to sell that building to the city of South Bend. Um, if you remember prior to that, back in the December timeframe, uh, we all met in, in an executive session to discuss this possibility uh, and, and went through some of the details there. Uh, the, sec the next step after um, that January 24th uh, meeting and the passage of that resolution was the schools were required to submit to the Indiana, an attorney, the Indiana Attorney General a application for approval of the sale. Um, they did submit that and we, we, we did receive confirmation and approval from the Indiana Attorney General uh, that this sale would meet the, the requirements of the statute uh, and would be allowed to go forward uh, if, if we were able to come to terms. Here's where we are now. Um, so the, the third step here is the council approval and council appropriation. Um, so the appropriation of the funding to allow for the hiring of the architect and the continuation and finalization of the negotiations. Um, and then the final step would be for the city uh, acting through its Board of Public Works and the school corporation to adopt substantially identical resolutions uh, to authorize the sale on our agreed upon terms and conditions. Uh, as I said, the majority of the substantive uh, terms and conditions uh, have, been, have been finalized, most notably the price pending the, the, the completion of the due diligence. Um, but some of the things that might be very much of interest to, to you all and are certainly of interest to me, like the timing of uh, when we would take possession of the building and actually start moving in and being able to do some of the renovations, uh, that's, that is still, the negotiation of that is still ongoing. Um, the proposal, uh, and certainly the city side of it, is, is wanting to take possession this summer, uh, have the renovations completed this fall and winter, uh, and then look to be moving in uh, in 2023. So with that, um, that's the, the, the main thrust of the additional appropriations request. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions from council members on uh, anything related to the school's building uh, request or any of the other three appropriations requests uh, that are much smaller in magnitude on this bill. All right, thank you, Mr. Parker, for your presentation. Council members, do you have any questions of the petitioner? Councilman Wax. Thank you. Uh, according to the current arrangement, 
don't know if it's a lease agreement between the city and the county. Uh, can we legally get out at any time? Yes, yeah, so we believe we, we can. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, so I won't speak to the legal provisions that uh, that, that back uh, or that are behind this. Uh, but the original agreement that we have with the county dates back to when this building was constructed in the 60s. Um, and the provisions around uh, the termination of that agreement are such that we believe we can get out at any point. So there would be no penalty or early termination? <coughs> or no. Okay. And um, is there a reason for, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand why in our current um, usage we have, I think it's 85% usable square footage and then it drops to about 70. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. The, re the main reason why is that all of the mechanicals in this building are on the fifth floor, um, whereas in the school's building, we would obviously have rooms and space designed for the HVAC systems and, and the coolers and all the other stuff that I don't know very much about. Um, whereas in this building, they're all on the fifth floor, so none of our space in this building is taken up by that. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilman Davis. Mr. Parker, you came before us earlier and I asked you a question about new build out versus what's happening here. Did you get the information or? Did so yes, so we, we did talk um, uh, with our public works director and uh, the average cost of new commercial construction. So new residential construction is a little bit cheaper, but new commercial construction, which is what this would be, uh, is running 200 to $300 a square foot. So for a $65,000, or 65,000 square foot building, uh, if you do the math, that's just shy of $20 million. Um, and that doesn't include things like the FF&E, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment, and you know the purchase of land if we needed to purchase land, all of those things. Sure, and, and I think you said that before you left out of here, but we weren't certain that was the actual figure um, as to the reason why I've asked for the information I have given the real estate deal. Uh, I think that the idea of, uh, of of discussing um, the actual value of a building before we take it over, if we are going to take it over, um, would be um, beneficial on our end and, and, and it would be prudent on our end, especially in the public trust. So I, um, I'm still there, right? I, I'm still not getting what I'm asking for. I did call two local developers earlier um, prior to this meeting and they were under $200, $200 per square foot. No one went past uh, 150. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I talked to Mr. Dave Matthews. I think he was probably a look the on the higher end, but it never touched 200. Um, so I, I think that it, it will be beneficial and it'll be a value on this council's end to have uh, our own information, everything that you've talked about today was school's information, it wasn't the city's information. And quite naturally, the seller will always make the deal uh, apropos for everyone. So, uh, you know, I just think that we will be doing ourselves a, a disservice and the taxpayers of this community a disservice if we just move forward with just the school corporation's figures. Is there any idea of, 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 our, of us acquiring or hiring the consultants to make sure that this deal is going to be uh, what we desire to be at the end of the day? Uh, y yes, um, so the, uh, the, there was an external uh, independent appraisal done, uh, which is where the, the value of the building itself came from. Um, so that was the, fir the first piece of that. Uh, and then as I talked about a little bit earlier, we did hire a consultant and we'll look to hire an architect to assess the current state of the building and get a fuller picture of all of the, the underlying structural mechanicals, the roof, the electrical system, all of that, and where they are at in the life cycles. There, there is that. That report that you said that you received, the first one, the, the, the appraised value, that came from the school corporation, am I correct? That's right. Okay, again, not our information. Um, again, I, I really believe, and, and I'm not speaking against what the deal is. I'm not saying we shouldn't move. I just know that judiciously and with great intent, we need to have our own information. I would do the same thing if it was my own house or me buying my own business. I need my own information, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Councilman White? Yes, I did have a question. 
and I apologize, I should have asked this during the committee meeting. It deals with the law enforcement continuing education. Uh, are more officers taking advantage of this program? So the, yeah, in that fund, um, it, it's related to the appropriation of um, some of the justice assistance grants okay. that we receive from the Department of Justice. Um, so we write those grants every year for in our police department for specific um, items to purchase. Um, and so this year, it's being used for things like uh, the the AEDs, which we talked about earlier, um, and then some of the other items that are that are mentioned in the in the notes to that appropriation request. So although the fund itself is called Law Enforcement Continuing Education, uh, it is it's used more broadly than uh, just continuing education items. Thank you. Anyone else have any anything else? Thank Councilwoman you. Rachel Thomas Morgan. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Pecker, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a comment, and, and then I had, do have a question, but um, as we've been talking about the cost of new construction, um, I, I just want to comment about how about the environmental and sustainable um, impact of reusing existing buildings as opposed to new construction. I'm always going to be an advocate for reuse of building over new construction, um, especially when we are looking at um, large buildings in our downtown area and surrounding um, areas that, uh, um, that could be great homes to, um, to organizations and, and corporations. That's my comment. My question is, um, in that, did um, was there, uh, this was clearly a, a great opportunity um, and a win-win for the city, city and the schools, possibly a win-win-win, including the county. Um, but was there any consideration for, for other um, buildings? Sure, um, so we, in, the, in the past, two or three years, I would say no. Um, but as I've shared with, with council and other venues, um, the, the city's been open to moving from our current building for a number of years, really ever since um, I've, I've come on board. Um, it's just kind of been waiting for the right opportunity. So along the way, um, our director of facilities management and central services has done some evaluations of what it would look like to move in other buildings uh, in downtown, what it would cost to, to build a, a brand new city hall, um, what it would cost to just completely renovate our floors in a current building um, and sort of fully just make this our home for, for the foreseeable future. Um, so those analyses have been done. Um, I know uh, as, as recently as 2018 and 2019, um, really this particular uh, opportunity came about because the schools were looking to sell this building. Uh, and so we inquired whether, you know, there, there would be a price point that would make sense financially, and we sort of started conversations. So after those conversations started, there wasn't looking at other opportunities, but uh, along the way, there have been. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Anyone else? Councilman Warner? Uh, reserve my comments for the comment period. Thank you. Vice President, Ms. Gassi? I, I just want to, uh, and then I'll, 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 I'll do, well, go ahead. Why don't we have that information? That's the information I've been asking for this entire time. And it's just kind of like, you know, Henry, be quiet and just deal with what, um, you know, what we're giving you. I think it's for a better conversation. And if you're going to negotiate a price, we should have our own information as well. Yeah, you're talking about the information that we did when we did an analysis yeah, in 2018 that. Yeah, and 2019. all of that stuff that you just said that we are already done. I, Yes, so we do have that information. I, it, it, we should share it. I'd be happy to share it with you if you. If That'd you, be like if really awesome. Great. Yeah. Uh, President McBride, you're online. Thank you. I just wanted to um, hold on, let me get some light here. Just wanted to say that I did speak with Commissioner Costelny and their consultant Steve Dalton and uh, some of the county council, the council president, Morton, and they talked about um, the opportunity it is to benefit them as well for us as a city moving out of the um, facility because they lacked the uh, space and they could utilize um, 
the extra space if we were to vacate. So I just wanted to go on record about their comments that I've had with the county council as well. So I think that it would be a, a win for all three entities and I'll yield. Mr. Parker, my, I have two questions. Uh, first of all, how many parking spaces are available at this building? Sure, yeah, so the, the garage itself, um, I'd have to get you the, the total number of spaces, um, but uh, the number of spaces that the school corporation currently leases from the, the, um, from the city is 125. Okay. And there are obviously other spaces if we need to flex that number, um, but that's the current number. That's one of the big issues with, uh, with where we're at now is parking. And, and being able to have at least 125 or more. And, and I should clarify that the 125, I believe is they utilize all of those for their employees. Um, and then obviously the garage is open uh, for the public to park in. Um, if they're there for less than two hours, it's free. Um, and you know, we would, we own the garage and so we would have the ability to set policies around uh, who could park there and when. And, and so that, that's my first of the positive things and then what you said is what it will cost us to facilitate this for annually is about $400,000. What we're paying now is $610,000 plus what we're paying to the water company, which is almost $60,000. So that's $670,000 that we pay and anybody who is a uh, homeowner knows that it's better to own than rent. So $400,000 is what it will cost us as far as maintaining it. But then if we don't, you know, we're, we're saving $270,000. Um, the school corporation put $7 million into the building and we're buying it for $2.8 million. Yeah, correct. I know if I was an investor, I, that's, <laughs> that's what I would be going to owning, not renting. You can get everybody in, you can consolidate. It makes a big difference. All right. Now we're gonna go to the public. Is there anyone in the public wishing to speak in favor of Bill 08-22? There's no one from the public that's expressing interest to speak in favor of Bill 0822. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak in opposition? Uh, there, oh, okay. <laughs> My name is <clears throat> Reverend Henry L. Davis, Sr., 215 North Sheridan Street, South Bend, Indiana, 46619. I'm a taxpayer, and what I'm hearing, first I heard lease, then I hear ownership. Then I heard that the school corporation just put $6 million into the building, and they're only selling it for 2.8. Uh, that don't sound right. Something's wrong with that picture. There's too much money going somewhere that's not accounted for. Is there a mortgage on the building? I haven't heard that. I know the building hasn't been paid off, but yet you're talking about moving somewhere and you're only talking about $400,000 a year. It has to be more money than that. Something to me is not being say, said. I'm just asking questions because it's my dollar that you all are talking about spending, my grandchildren's dollar that you're talking about spending. So I need to hear more than what I've heard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Parker, if you, I'm sorry. Thank you, Reverend Davis. Yes, thank you, Reverend Davis. Um, so the, the building would not be mortgaged from the city side. We would be funding the acquisition and the renovation in cash. Um, and so that ongoing operational cost is really just the 
the operating of the building, the utilities and those kinds of things. Um, the, the reason the school corporation did put about $7 million into the building back in 2005. So uh, over time, as everyone knows, the upgrades and those kinds of things depreciate and need to be replaced and renovated and those kinds of things. Uh, and so the value is not currently today $7 million. Uh, the, that was the purpose of having the independent, uh, um, the independent appraisal come in to try and really value what it's currently worth today. And as I said, it, it came back right at that $2.8 million number. So it is a, I think it's a, it's a fair deal. Uh, for both the city as well as the school corporation. And then in terms of how it saves money overall and how it saves the taxpayer dollar and why we keep talking about this as a win-win is that it allows the consolidation of, of buildings on the school corporation side. So they currently operate both their admin building as well as the location that they'll be moving to, which I believe is Brown. Um, I don't know if that's been finalized, but that way I know that that's what they were talking about. Um, they currently operate both of those buildings. This would allow them to operate one fewer building, which would result in an operational savings for them. So it really does help them financially as well. Is it from the school corporation side, no. Um, they bought the building back in 2005 for $600,000 in cash, I believe. That's correct. There is no picking up of bond acquisitions. There's no new bonds. There's no, there's no debt associated with this transaction. Okay. All right, at this point, the public hearing on Bill 08-22 is now closed. Council members, um, would you like to make any statements? Mr. Wax. Mr. Chair, do you mind if I ask, a, in addition to my comments, a brief question? Sure. Um, is there uh, any or any uh, associated moving costs? Would, is that included in, in this appropriation or would there be a separate appropriation for that? So the, uh, the, that's a great question. The moving costs would be uh, included in the $5 million renovation budget and um, that, that, so there would be no an anticipated uh, additional appropriation request and obviously if costs run higher than expected then we would come back and talk about why that's the case, but yes. Thank you. Uh, so just, uh, I'm going to uh, um, vote in favor of this. I just uh, want to reiterate some of my comments from earlier today that while I recognize there's a balance that the administrative administration needs uh, signaling and approval from the council before they could go ahead and do things, so they need the appropriations before they do um, actions. At the same time, um, our job from the council is to make sure that we are appropriating and spending the money in a responsible manner. And to that end, we can't have the spending that's too far distant from the appropriations wealth. And I just wish that we wouldn't have, um, in cases like this where the spending for today is mixed with spending for tomorrow where we don't know exactly how it's going to be spent. I recognize that makes it easier for the administration, but I don't believe that's our job is to make it easier for the administration. Any, anyone else? Um, President McBride? No, I spoke my comments. Thank you. Any other comments from council members? I don't believe we have. Councilman Troy Warner? So, Kind of what I've heard is uh, we're getting 50% more square footage um, and spending less money. Uh, this is the last city hall uh, up here that I've shared, uh, 1970, uh, so it was the year before I was born. So for much of South Bend's history, we've had our own city hall, um, and I, I, I think it's time to do it again. The building is cramped if you've ever gone upstairs. Uh, they're sitting on top of each other, and uh, that's on the county side and the city side. Um, and then the economics just makes sense. Uh, we're saving potentially $250,000 for 50% more square footage. Um, and uh, I'd be excited to, uh, to see how things shape and develop and, and uh, take part of design plans, and hopefully we can incorporate some of the history uh, the city 
and this old building and the uh, there was at least I think two other city halls before that into those design plans so I'll be supporting this thank you Vice President Michowski um, yeah when I take a, when I when I heard Mr. Parker say that when they considered staying here and he says no it's always been talked about us moving on and getting our own city hall so it's not like it's um, something that they um, it's something that they have taken careful consideration of I should say um, they haven't just went out and said yes this is our mission to do this no they found an opportunity to collaborate with the schools uh, the schools are downsizing their building their buildings I should say it gives us more space um, gives more parking space, um, saves money. Um, so for me, I believe that that is a good steward um, of looking at every opportunity with taxpayer money uh, on how we're gonna move to our own city hall. I think it's exciting. I plan on supporting it. Um, and I would like to thank them for all the time. We started, uh, this idea came up last year and here we are, it's March and we're seeing that it's coming to fruition. Um, of course, pending a couple other th other things that need to happen yet, but I'm excited about it, and I do plan on supporting it, and I believe that they have um, not hurried into anything. I think they've been very patient and found a wonderful opportunity. Anyone else? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I'm grappling with this. And I, and I want to, and I probably um, will be, you know, um, belaboring the point, but no one has said anyone is not doing anything up to par. We are supposed to be here asking questions. We are supposed to be here making sure we are being fiduciary, responsible fiduciary agents for the city's taxpayers' dollars. And so if a council member, it doesn't matter which one, one out of the nine, ask the question, it's, it's incumbent on the administration to answer it or find an answer for it. Um, it's not nagging, it's not harassing. If you're having other conversations in other places uh, with members of the, of, of the, of the administration, that's awesome, share it with your council colleagues. But the idea of trying to make another council member uh, feel bad for asking questions or doing their job or or whatever that is runs and flies directly in the face of what we have here and this, this is called our democracy people are elected to office to do their job allow them to do it and if a, mem a member from the other part of government does doesn't desire to 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 uh, support the questions or respond to it then this council as a body should demand that because if one doesn't get it, it may be you the next time that doesn't get it. So there's like it's like it's not like a free lunch thing. I think it, it, it's a, it's a it's a standard thing. It's it's a respect thing. It's it's a it's the job thing is what it is. So Mr. Parker, I appreciate you responding, and and I thank you for responding. That goes to any other member of the administration that comes here and, and speaks on uh, behalf of the mayor's office. But again, this council is still as charged with doing their job. And I and I and I I'm done. Mm -hmm. All right, well. I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 08-22. Chair, I'd like to move that we send Bill 08-22 to the full council with a favorable recommendation. There is a motion. I'll second. And a second. Clerk Jones, please call the roll on Bill 08-22. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. I'm not sure if Council Member Hammond came into the meeting. She's absent today. Okay. Excuse. She's excused absence. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice President Muskowski? Aye. Council Member Davis. I'm voting against it based upon what Eli said earlier, so nay. Council Member Lee. Aye. 
President McBride. Aye. So we have seven ayes. All right. Bill 08-22 will be sent to the full council with a favor favorable recommendation. I will now entertain a motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole and report back to the full council. So moved. Second. It has been moved and second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those that oppose? The motion carries. The full council is now back in session. This is the portion of our meeting where bill bills are given a third reading and action is taken regarding bills that were heard during committee of the whole. Clerk Jones, could you please give bill 8-22 a third reading? 8-22, third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, appropriating additional funds for certain departmental and city services operations <coughs> for the year 2022 of 183,000 from the Law Enforcement Continuing Education Fund number 220, 7,800,000 from the Local Income Tax Economic Development Fund number 408, 180,000 from the Sewage Works Operating Fund number 641, and 347,697 from the Equipment Vehicle Leasing Fund number 750. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Lee, is there a recommendation from the Committee of the Whole regarding Bill 8-22? Bill 08-22 um, comes from the Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation. Okay, thank you so much. I'll now entertain a motion regarding Bill 08-22. I'd like to move for passage. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Clerk Jones, could you please call the roll? Yes. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Vice President Nisgotsky? Aye. Council Member Davis? Nay. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Seven ayes. Thank you. Uh, Bill 08 22 has passed. And we are going to go into resolution. This is the portion of the council meeting where the common, where the common council hears bills filed as proposed resolutions. The title of each proposed resolution is read by the clerk and a report from the committee chairperson of the standing committee to which the bill is referred to for advisory review and recommendation is then given. Um, During the public portion of each proposed resolution, members of the public are invited to address the council. We ask that you give your name, address, and comments on the bill. If you have any questions, they will be addressed by the presenter during their fertile, by their rebuttal. Each member of the public is limited to five minutes with those speaking in favor and against going first, followed by opposition. Uh, and then a minute rebuttal for the presenter of the bill. So now I'd like to make a motion to hear the substitute bill 22-13. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you, motion carried. Um, so resolution 22-13 um, was sponsored by Councilman Troy Warner, Sher President Sharon McBribe, Vice President Sheila Nisgotsky, Council members Karen White, Rachel Tomas Morgan, and Eli Wax are the sponsors coming from the Community Relations Committee. Is there a committee report? Clerk, um, Vice President yes. uh, Nisgotsky, Clerk Jones needs to read the substitute. Oh, she still does need yes. to read the uh -huh. substitute bill. Oh, my apologies, oh, Clerk no Jones. That's okay. Could you please read the substitute bill? Yes. Uh, 2213, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana establishing a process for selection of Community Police Review Board Office Director and a process for appointment of the initial review board members. Thank you so much. Is there a committee report? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Bill 2213 was heard in the uh, Community Relations Committee this evening 
and uh, comes out of that committee with a favorable recommendation. Thank you, and is there a presenter? Uh, certainly, uh, President McBride, would you like to open? Sure, thank you. I just would like to say thank you for the opportunity. It's an exciting day for us to move ahead with the uh, CRB board today, and hopefully that um, all of the, my colleagues will uh, concur and pass uh, the resolution for us to move forward. It outlines a step-by-step -step transparent and accountable uh, resolution for us to move ahead. And um, I just think that the public will have input and will be engaged and we will look forward to working with everyone in the community and getting this done. So with that, I will yield. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, as one of the co-sponsors of the bill here, I would just like to say um, I echo President McBride's sentiments with this bill, a uh, resolution that's before us. It does create a clear process for hiring the director and the appointment of the board. It is something that has taken um, careful consideration on input from the public, white paper. Um, all of the council members have had an opportunity to have input on this so that there is a clear process to everyone in our community of no matter where we are at in this process um, of, of they can put a finger on it. They know exactly where it is that we're, we're at. Um, and I would like to thank Council Member Warner for all his work in putting this together, but certainly it was um, input from all of us and the public input. We heard that loud and clear last time and with careful consideration. I know this took a little bit to get here, but we wanted to make sure it's right and make sure that we move this initiative forward. So I'd just like to thank you for everyone's hard work and commitment towards moving this resolution forward. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Nitzkowski. Uh, so the, the ordinance or the uh, resolution kind of lays out two processes. One process is for the selection of the director. Uh, that is the uh, paid individual that acts as the department head, uh, the head of the review office. And then the uh, second selection process is for the board members. Those are the citizens, the community, a uh, part of the community police review board, uh, volunteers that uh, will be on the board itself. Um, the traditional city HR process for hiring a department head is a three-step process. Uh, the, the traditional first step is a, uh, a phone interview that's conducted um, really just to get make sure that the, the applicants have minimal requirements um, and, and to, to lay out to them what the process will be going forward and what they can expect moving forward. Uh, the, the, then the traditional second step is a, uh, a larger a group meeting um, that is usually done by the, all the department heads and uh, HR. And then the third step in the traditional process is a, a smaller meeting with the mayor and uh, chief of staff, again, HR, and uh, whoever the acting department head is. So we've kind of modeled this process after that traditional HR process, uh, except we've kind of injected some public input meetings, uh, one on the front end and one on the back end um, as we go along through this. So the first round, again, uh, as described on the, the PowerPoint here, would be if phone interviews conducted by the council president and the human resources representative, focusing really on the minimum strength or minimum requirements and the strengths of the candidates, also uh, informing candidates what the process will be going forward. Um, notes will be taken. Those notes will not be released to the public. Uh, scoring rubric will be used. Uh, again, those will not be released to the public, but will be used by council going forward. Um, then uh, shortly after that first round meeting will be uh, public meeting number one. That will be an input meeting to gather input from council and the community on uh, what kind of traits, characteristics, experiences um, do they value as we put together questions, scenarios, um, hypothetical situations, ethical tests or ethical questions uh, for rounds two and three. Um, there will be a then 
executive session initial review of applicants by the whole council. Um, council attorney and HR will prepare a uh, background review packet, a background check. And then we'll also do a public release of uh, demographic data and uh, information on the rest of the process uh, to the public. Um, and then there will be a closed meeting to determine a removal of any candidates after that first round from the pool. Uh, the second round then, the ordinance itself requires a executive session. Uh, so the second round would be that executive session stated by the ordinance. There would be notes again taken on the candidate responses. Uh, however, this time we would prep those responses for public release. Um, the scoring rubrics would not be publicly released. The uh, executive session would be, the council would be able to review all the applications, the notes from both uh, round one and round two, the, the rubrics and the background check packets. Um, there would then again be another closed meeting to determine a list of finalists. The, the finalist list would be no more than five individuals. Those names would be released to the public, to the community. And then the third round of interviews would take place in a large public forum. Um, each of the candidates would have time to introduce themselves, uh, give their thoughts and ideas on the office and what they would do uh, if they were to become the director. Um, then the interview process would take place by council attorney and the human resources representative. At the end of this, the all of the interviews by the candidates, the floor would then be opened up to the public to give their input and thought on the candidate and on the process. And, um, and then council would then uh, have to forward three names, well, no more than three names, uh, to the mayor um, by resolution. Uh, that part is also uh, required by the ordinance. That's kind of the selection process for the director's office. Uh, then the board selection process. Their application has been currently open since, uh, since last summer and online. Um, we would continue to leave that application period open until mid-April. Um, President McBride would put out a, uh, a media release uh, informing the public that the uh, application is still open and of the, uh, the closing deadline for that. Um, council members would each nominate one candidate, district people within their district, at large people within the city. Um, there would be, uh, after those nominees are done, again, a background review packet would be done, reviewed by council, um, and then the nominees would be introduced at a public meeting and uh, Again, an, another resolution, this would be a appointment resolution actually appointing those nominees to the first community police review board uh, would need to be passed by the council. So with that, I will uh, open it up and, and take any questions from council. Thank you so much. So I guess that's actually your job to do that. <laughs> Thank you so yeah. much. Um, is there any um, council members that have a question? Councilman Lee. Um, I, I know that it, um, no sworn officer can be the director. Is that also true for like a retired or uh, law enforcement person? I'm going to punt those to Mr. Palmer. No, it's not true for retired uh, individuals. It's only currently sworn police officers. Okay. I think that was a question that people were wondering. Um, you know, could it be somebody that has had a, had a that was retired or or whatever? So, did you have another question? Was that the only? Oh, one? That's it. Okay. Anybody else on the council have a question? Okay. If not, then I'm going to move to the uh, public portion. Is there anyone here from the public wishing to speak in favor? of uh, bill t substitute bill 22-13. I don't see anyone from the public wishing to speak in favor of, res of this resolution. Is there anyone wishing to speak against? If you could just please state your name and address for the record. 
Reverend Henry L. Davis, Sr., 215 North Sheridan, South Bend, Indiana, 46619. First question is, isn't this a law now? The board, the, 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 this, this matter that we're talking about, it's not a resolution. It's been voted as a law, right? Am I right, Karen? It has passed. Isn't it a law? It's a yes or no answer. It's, it's a law now. The, there is an ordinance establishing the CRB. Um, this uh, resolution <laughs> fills out the process by which the uh, director and the board members are appointed. But it's a law. It's not a resolution. The ordinance establishes the CRB board. The resolution establishes how those people are selected or hired. I'm not talking about this. I'm saying you cannot add a resolution to a law. That's where I'm getting at. The resolution can fill in any spaces that the ordinance leaves open. As but long as it is not inconsistent with the ordinance, it can be passed. Okay, within that law, it, it talks about no law enforcement, past, present, or future, or past, or present can be in that. If that's the case of what you're saying, then Mr. Reynolds and Ms. Jones was done a disservice. If you can have your president, which is a past police officer, Mr. Warner works for the county. He's their attorney. You have done those two a disservice because of their, Mr. Reynolds' connection with the police department. You have to stay in tune. I don't understand what you mean by doing anyone a disservice. You mm. got, Mr. Reynolds was let go because of his uh, affiliation with the police department in Indianapolis. Mr. Reynolds what resigned and at the time he was hired, he was not a sworn police officer. No, he was let go because he was once a police officer. Let's be real now. We no, can play Mr. a word Reynolds game. Is we can play a I word know. game, but I'm not here for a word game. I'm here for clarification. Because well, if we allow, if you allow this is thing, that he was he if, resigned. Pardon me. The clarification is he resigned. He was forced. He was made to resign because of the fact that he was a past police officer. I don't believe that's accurate. Well, you, you can play a word game. No. Well, well, sir, the so attorney has um, answered your question. No, he hasn't answered my question. Um, and at this point, no, um, do you I, have I'm, any I'm, other I, questions I got three right points. Now? I got okay. three points. And you do, you, are, you do have five minutes. Yes, yeah, so you're using my time. Yes, and you are limited. What I'm saying, we're going back the same direction because it seems like with all of this going on, it's trying to be destroyed. You're not moving forth with the blessings of the community. Everything I heard from Mr. Warner's mouth is after the fact. Why can't we sit down in the beginning and make the decisions as he and the mayor makes the decisions, as the president of this council make a decision. You come to us with what you want us to have. We are a part, I'm th no, I'm not directing this to you, this is to the council. Why is it that we can't sit down at day one, along with you all, to make a selection? That's what needs to happen. There's no trust. There isn't any trust. I don't trust you in that matter. To say this, you five just got here on the board. Karen knows. Mr. Davis knows. 
Okay, sir, at this time, you just made a verbal attack on all I didn't this make council no, members. I said you didn't and know. you have no trust did not in say us, you didn't know. In, I didn't in the attack council you. members here, and I'm I not going to let you, you discredit I did not, I did the not council attack members you. here that are I did not attack you. I, I was making a point. By saying you do not trust any of us in this process. But that's my right. I have freedom of no speech. Process to begin but don't with. I have freedom of speech? I can say it. In the it may not of be this, true. I said that attacks on any person or person I may result in an individual you. I just said without I didn't notice forfeit, forfeiting the remainder of no. his or her allotted time. But I said. And you what have I called said. out Mr. Warner's name more than once, affiliating him with a police officer. He is I not just a made sworn a statement. I told the officer. truth. I'm I said, the truth I told too. that wasn't an attack. And I said he time, works for him. How is that an attack? How is that an attack when I say where he works at? For five minutes, and your time is up. You took most of them. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak against the bill that's a uh, resolution before us? And please state your name and address for the record, and you do have five minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Mary Bundy, 318 South Francis Street, South Bend, Indiana, 46617. I'm not really up here for or against, but I, I would like to um, just reiterate the optics of this uh, position and who's eligible to be applying for the position. So it is a a process of reviewing police conduct. And I think that allowing former police officers um, the ability to be a part of that could be a conflict of interest. I'm not saying it is, I'm saying it could be. And so the optics of that would undermine public trust. That is the only portion of this that um, I think maybe should be looked at by the council. And that's a small portion. It would leave open for a lot of um, talented people to uh, partake in the process, but not be from former law enforcement. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, next, next we have um, Jordan Geiger. Jordan, please unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. Uh, four two, uh, Jordan Geiger, 424 South uh, Michigan Street, Unit 660, um, <clears throat> South Bend, Indiana, 46601. Uh, I'm not, I'm really not here to speak for or against it. I just was only able to raise my hand at this point. Um, <clears throat> I just had a, I really just had a question because I wasn't able to make the uh, committee meeting that I think was last week. Um, but I just was curious about um, like what demographic data um, you all will likely release. And um, I was I was wondering why I think if I read this correctly, it wouldn't be released until like the second <clears throat> the second round. Um, I was wondering if we could if it could be released um, earlier than that in the first round, just so we know what the you know the background of the pool of applicants. And then my other question uh, is about the <clears throat> the process for establishing the rubric and um, the second round of interviews, it's limited to uh, like the, the council attorney, the council president, the council vice president, past president, HR rep, and community relations chair. <clears throat> and I was just wondering why that wasn't open to um, all, of the, all of the council, the full council. Um, so those were just the questions that I had. Okay, thank you. Okay. Or that I have, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Okay, next we have Catherine Redding. Uh, Catherine, if you would unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. 
Yes, <clears throat> Catherine Redding, and I'm at 418 uh, Lamont Terrace, South Bend, Indiana, 46616. And I kind of wanted to see if you guys could answer uh, Jordan's question as well. Um, I know that you um, uh, intentionally uh, heard heard his questions, but I my so I'm I'm speaking uh, in opposition because um, to my understanding this um, uh, resolution was in fact uh, brought to us by uh, Councilman uh, Henry Davis as well as uh, Lori Hammond. And so uh, it seems uh, to me that when you have these, it's, it seems like a contradiction um, when you have police or, or ex-police officers um, expediting uh, this uh, review board. Um, it it kind of, it seems like the same thing that we've been had, um, you know, police investigate themselves and find that they um, done nothing wrong. Uh, so it seems very contradiction, a contradiction to me um, as to how uh, we can actually see something that's actually sustainable in the community um, and where people feel comfortable to make these complaints um, when we're filing complaints with ex-former ex -former police officers. And so I, I do understand what Mr. Davis was saying because it's very contradictive um, to have this police board and have ex-police officers. And I'm sure that we all are very well aware that the community asked um, for that not to be uh, a part of the uh, positioning of this review board. Um, so yeah, if you don't, I don't mind, I, I appreciate you guys to answer Jordan's question and also just uh, keep in mind that the community asked for there not to be any um, stakeholders of the community for them to be police officers. I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's other candidates that are, you know, qualified for the position either than the police because that's a contradiction of, if that's the case, we might as well continue to go down to the police station and file police reports. I mean, I mean, I get complaints against the police. We might as well go down to the police station. Um, so yeah, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I believe that the demographics are stated to be released around one and two. I could be wrong on that, but I'd have to go back and look. Yeah, I believe uh, it's only round two. Only round two, I okay. Believe so. Um, but the uh, demographics, uh, at least, you know, what we've discussed so far have been uh, uh, gender, um, race, um, there was one other, it just lost out of my head. Um, oh yeah, geography, zip code um, have been the demographics that uh, we've heard so far. Um, then in regard to the kind of the decision making group, uh, due to open door requirements, um, a larger group of council members cannot uh, uh, have a closed door session and take a vote, so that was limited to uh, four individuals. If, my, if I may add to that, uh, uh, Councilman Warner. Uh, the idea behind that would be that there would be an initial cut of however many applications came in, you know, whether it's 10 or 100, it would be a little unwieldy to have a public meeting to discuss the applications of 100 different individuals. So uh, the, the original cut is, is pretty minimal as far as qualifications, and it's only after that in, uh, initial cut that public meetings could uh, kick in. And then as far as uh, law enforcement, um, that's something that was in the original bill that was originally passed, um, the, the bill that was, was presented by Mr. Davis and Ms. Hammond, and is in the ordinance, and uh, so 
Um, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but that's what's in the ordinance. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, the explanation and the rebuttal for the two, for Ms. Redding and uh, for Mr. Geiger. Um, Clerk Jones, is there anyone else wishing to speak? I no. would say in favor or against at this point, um, since we kind of have a mixed. Um, no, no, that is off our list. Okay, thank you so much. Um, then at this point, um, I'm going to close the public meeting on the substitute, substitute bill 22-13 um, and go back to the council to see if they have any final comments in reference to the substitute bill 2213, Councilman Wax. Thank you, thank you, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. And um, I wanna thank uh, Councilman uh, Troy Warner and everybody else who helped develop this process and draft this resolution. Uh, there was a lot of, um, a lot of time and thought and work that went in to make this happen. So thank you for that. Uh, in 2020, when this council passed the CRB ordinance, um, at that time, I didn't believe that the CRB is the best solution to foster better relationships with law enforcement and the citizens of South Bend, and I remain in that belief today. That said, the council did pass the CRB resolution, and it's our job as the council to work with that ordinance to make it um, the best that we can and to um, work to make it as effective as possible. Uh, for the CRB to be successful, there needs to be trust in the process. That trust is from all sides. That trust is from the citizens of South Bend so that they know how this is gonna work and how it's gonna play out. It also includes trust from the administration, trust from the council, trust from law enforcement. It, everybody needs to be on board for this to work. If this is a one-sided or a closed process, uh, it won't be effective. Um, this resolution does chart a clear, transparent path to how to go forward, and I think that will help foster some of the trust that's necessary. That's why I support this resolution, even though I do have reservations for the CRB resolution, for the CRB ordinance. Thank you so much. Um, Councilman Lee. Yep, thank you, Chair, and uh, again, um, thank you, uh, Councilman Wax, for, for what you just said. It is very important that um, the CRB is important to our community. And as Councilman Wax said, it is so important that we be on board with it because the community wants it. Um, and transparency and accountability does not have to divide our city. It doesn't have to be divisive. It makes things better, it makes things whole. Um, it makes everybody understand that if, if something happens, then there's a recourse to go along with that. So um, charting out a, a path forward was important. And so thank you for the, the many steps, there's 55 steps. Um, uh, this is what our community wanted. That's we, we wanted to get the CRB up and running, get a director and get people on the board, and we are finally moving in that direction. And so this is a great day for our city. This is a great day for those who have had injustices. We're actually moving forward so that transparency and accountability can be, um, people can, can, can now receive that. And so um, I'm in support of this. Thank you so much. Councilman Davis. Sure, thank you. I, um, just two things. The first question I'm gonna ask our, our, our attorney, Mr. Palmer, uh, is this process, what's happening, is this legal? I is believe it is, or I wouldn't have, uh, uh, I would have advised council otherwise. Sure, I, it, was, it was just a question. It's, it's for later on, because something I want to make sure that we're all on the right, same wavelength. And then the other thing that I wanted to clarify, and I don't, you know, I guess people are always asking for clarity. Or I think, and what I understood is that the level of discussion about law enforcement having a participation or a hand in this 
has a lot to do with the lack of trust with law enforcement. We spent over, I don't know, it's a long time. I started this back in 2014. Uh, we really went at it over the last two years. And that's the only thing that you kept hearing was a lack of um, trust with law enforcement. And so when the idea of it coming back through and that President McBride, who is law enforcement, and Mr. Warner, who is also works or is considered law enforcement, I don't know how, what the proper title is, that is what scares people about what may happen with this whole process. I'm not saying or suggesting that anything is wrong, but your title reads those things. And so if I'm reading your title, I'm going to question it if I was already against the idea of law enforcement participating. That it's, it's clear, it's, that's it. I'm not saying that I am, but I do know and I understand why people are saying those things. And so I just think that we need to be cognizant that the fact that we have people who are law enforcement or participate with law enforcement does give other people the chills. Thank you, uh, President McBride. Thank you so much. First of all, I'm not law enforcement. I don't have arresting powers. I'm not a sworn in officer. And I also have a duty to do my job. I'm opposite of that. I'm community corrections and provide a tool for people to rehabilitate. But I appreciate your comment. And secondly, um, I would just like to say thank you to everyone who spoke um, up in the audience and if you were on teams. And I just want to reiterate um, for your concerns and your valid questions to make sure that we make the point that this resolution um, is the step-by-step -step processes and procedures of going forward. However, the ordinance that was drafted and drawn up by the original sponsors, which was uh, Councilman Davis and Councilwoman Lori Hammond, we have not deviated from their original ordinance, which reads about the law enforcement. So if you go back and look at the original ordinance that was proposed, nothing's changed from their proposal of bringing it to the council. So I wanted to make it clear. So I appreciate when I believe it was Ms. Redding that said that she had spoken with Mr. Davis and Ms. Hammond. This is their original ordinance when they were co-sponsors. What you see before you is the written out processes of us going forward. So I do hope that with the ordinance that was brought before us that we continued on with, that we all can work together to make sure that we build that trust and that we can move forward. So I open that door as the president and the opportunity and welcome you all and anyone in the community to walk through with us on that process. Thank you. Thank you so much, President McBride. Appreciate your comments. Council Member White is also a sponsor on that piece of legislation as well. A couple of people have been talking about it, and so we want to make sure that she is named as well. She was along with us on the ride, the long ride. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, so Council I would Woman? like to say as we look at the, the resolution, again, it is laying out the processes and procedures that is modeled after the original resolution that was passed um, last year. Again, the public uh, had shared their concerns that they were not involved in the process in terms of interviewing uh, the candidates, nor did they have opportunity to uh, meet with them and to hear their philosophy and to have a sense of where they were at, and these were the, candid the candidates that were brought in after going through the screening process. I think it was very important for the public to have uh, input, for the public to have a clear understanding of the steps, the processes, and the levels in which that they would become engaged. Because this is not only the council uh, ordinance, this is the city, and it's the citizens as well as the council listening, responding, and creating a path forward to look at the various processes and timelines so anyone can get a copy of the substitute bill. And the dates and the times is very clearly defined. And most importantly, it encouraged um, 
community en engagement from the citizens, and that is what is important because the title of this is a community police review board. So I support the um, substitute bill that is before us. Thank you so much. Um, Councilwoman Tomas Morgan. Thank you, Chair. I, um, a lot has been said already, but um, I, I do just want to add to a comments already made, and that is in the, in the rush to pass the um, Community Police Review Board ordinance um, in, boy, when was that now, in 20, 2020, 2020 um, there were, uh, we didn't get to a level of detail that you see in this resolution now. And so um, there was no process that had been approved or written uh, that would provide a, a guide, guidebook or um, framework for the council to select the review board director and to, um, and to select its board members. And so this, res and quite honestly, caused a lot of confusion as we moved to um, uh, um, fill those positions. And so the, the council taking this step with this resolution, as others have said, clearly step, stipulates what that process is. It invites, trans, it, it is um, transparent, it invites public input, um, and, uh, and the resolution um, allows the public to keep the council accountable to this process. So it's, it's, it's critical in that way and an important step forward. Thank you so much, Councilman Warner. Yes, uh, so through last year, we, uh, you know, there was discussion about processes. Um, you know, there was a, a couple proposed processes that were sent out that, uh, um, had four or five steps and uh, maybe 10 or 12 sentences and there were lots of questions um, and and questions never got answered and uh, then three weeks ago I uh, we had a meeting and I tried to restart that dialogue and it became very clear that without something very structured very detailed uh, none of the CRB would ever move forward. So um, I talked to Bob and Sharon and we decided it, it needed to be in a resolution so long as the resolution didn't conflict with the ordinance. It would be a plan that was detailed, that was specific, that was transparent. Um, I ask everybody to read the, the 10 page bill uh, it's very boring, it's, uh, but it's very detailed and it's step by step. This is what's going to happen. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. If something should fail, I tried, Bob and I tried to think of things that could go wrong and uh, um, roadblocks and grenades that would happen without derailing the train and getting things moving. Um, but really, it's at the essence, it's just a human resources process. Um, yeah, that's broken down as, as clearly and succinctly as possible, um, but it gives everybody specific details on what's going to happen and uh, um, a roadmap and transparency and there's accountability there too that uh, exists when, when you have a detailed plan like that. So um, I thank everybody for their uh, input and assistance. Um, and particularly the Human Resources Department upstairs, uh, they were tremendous help um, as we crafted that 10 pages of steps. And thank you all. Thank you. I believe we've had input from everyone at this point. Um, so at this point, I'd like to know if there is a motion in regard to the substitute bill 2213 that's before us. Bill, bill 22-13 for passage. Second. So there's been a motion to move substitute bill 22-13 forward for passage and duly seconded. Clerk Jones, could you please call the roll? 
Yes. Um, Vice President Nastaski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member <laughs> White? I'm sorry. You, okay. Aye, Lee Higg, I'm sorry. Okay. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Eight ayes. Thank you, um, Clerk Jones. Substitute Bill 22-13 has been adopted. So we're gonna move into the next portion of the council meeting for bills that are on first reading. So Clerk Jones, could you give Bill 10-22 uh, a first reading? 10-22, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, vacating the, vacating the following described property a 12 foot wide public alley running from Dewey Avenue on the east to Howard Street on the west for a distance of 205 feet plus or minus South Bend, Indiana. Thank you so much. I'd like to entertain a motion to send Bill 10-22 to public works and property vacation for public hearing and third reading on March 28th. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Clerk Jones, could you please give Bill 1122 a first reading? 1122, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, approving a petition of the Advisory Board of Zoning Appeals for the property located at 1033 Oak Street, Council Manning District Number 1, in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you so much, Clerk Jones. I would like to make a motion to send, or entertain a motion to send Bill 11-22 to BZA for public hearing on April 4th and ZNA committee and public hearing on the third reading for April 11th. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Clerk Jones could, or uh, do we have to do a roll call, Bob? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And Clerk Jones, could you please read Bill 12-22, a first reading? 12-22, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, north-south alley between North Mead Street and North Cayley Street, from West Keller Street, Keller Street to Marquette Boulevard. Thank you so much. I make a motion to send Bill 12-22 to Public Works and Property Vacation for Committee and Council public hearing and third reading on March the 28th. So moved. Second. It's been motion, there's been a motion and it's been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Clerk Jones, will you please give Bill 13-22 a first reading? 13-22, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, vacating the following described property. Alley Vacation, Street Alley near 1101 King Street. Thank you so much. A motion to send Bill 12-22 to Public Works and Property Vacation for committee meeting in, in council public hearing and third reading on March 28th. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion has been passed. That will be all of our first reading bills. And at this point, we're going to move to unfinished business. Is there any unfinished business from the council at this time? Councilman Wax. I'm not sure where this should go exactly, but I think unfinished business uh, might be the best place. Um, so this past week, the administration announced the utility forgiveness for using COVID relief funds that was uh, appropriated by the council. Um, so last year when the administration came to the council, they talked about um, applying some of the COVID relief funds toward utility forgiveness. And as part of that conversation, the administration um, stated pretty clearly that they would develop some sort of process to ensure that it wasn't given to everybody, but rather they would find some process to figure out um, a, a way of making sure that the relief would go to those who needed it. Um, I'm pretty confident that all 
nine members of the council want to uh, had no qualms about giving COVID relief uh, utility utility forgiveness for people who um, were struggling to pay their utilities as a result of COVID. But, and speaking for myself and possibly others, um, there wasn't uh, support for providing blanket forgiveness to anybody who may have decided not to pay their bills because there was a moratorium on shut up during COVID. Um, at that time, we appropriated it. I trusted the administration that they would um, develop the process like they said they would and was very disappointed when it finally came to, um, to put their money where their mouth is or maybe put our money where their mouth is. They just did it as a blanket forgiveness. Um, that sort of was getting to what I keyed on a couple times earlier today that when we appropriate funds, unfortunately we can't put strings on it. We could only appropriate the funds and hope uh, that the administration does what they say they will do with it. I, I can't say that the administration didn't have the authority to do a blanket forgiveness because the way the law works, they did. But I think it's a wake up call for at least me that um, going forward when there's appropriations where there isn't a plan in place now, um, that maybe there needs to be a greater pause to see um, before the funds are appropriated and wait to see the actual plan in advance. I don't know where that goes, but for me, it's unfinished business. Mr. Wax, I uh, agree with you, and that's why I ended up voting. That's why I, I vote no sometimes because of that. Um, there is a standard of doing business, should be, and no one should just get a free ride on anything, including myself. So if I show up with something, I should be able to prove that which I am saying and, and make good on it as well. So I agree with you on that, and I just hope that this council uh, begins to interrogate and also has a natural curiosity for some of these things that come, all of these things that come before us. Is there any um, other councilman with any unfinished business at this time? Is there any online? So at this point, uh, we're, is there any new business to come before the council? Councilman Davis? I want to be really quick with this. Uh, there was an article in the newspaper today uh, about how great Steve Reynolds is as a coach, as a father, as a spiritual guider, et cetera. Um, here at Washington High School. But one thing that has not been talked about are the structural inequities that exist in given areas throughout the city. Yes, he is doing an awesome job where he is at, but why does he have to do so much to, to gain, at the end of the day, so small of a value when it comes to the community at large? The social, and, and the uh, educational inequities in our city are profound. And it's so profound that, and I'll, I'll be done when I say this, that you may never see a Washington High School a girls or a boys basketball team ever win it again because you don't even have a Washington High School or enough to build a team. Um. I do have some new business. Um, I guess this will go under new business. Um, the Nexus Center is holding a COVID-19 clinic for any members in our community um, that may still be unvaccinated. They do have um, an app that you can get on and line and look at um, to where you can pre-register, but at this point they will take even walk-ins or pre-registrations. It's gonna be on the at the Nexus Center on South Main Street. It's just catty corner from La Casa de Amistad, and that'll be from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And myself and um, President White, or I mean President McBride and um, Councilwoman White have been working with the bugs as to get this word out, and I think uh, we've determined we've probably, at this point, reached somewhere over about 500 people. So mm -hmm. it is our hope that we can have a good turnout for them and and get unvaccinated people an opportunity to be vaccinated. So is there any other new business at this time? If not, I'm gonna move on to privilege of the floor. 
And I would like to read a statement uh, prior to the privilege of the floor that disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech and or actions, as well as verbal attacks on any person may result in the individual without notice, forfeiting the remainder of his or her allotted time. Individuals who wish to address the council must state their name and residential address. Individuals will be limited to three minutes only. The maximum time limit for this portion of the meeting shall be 30 minutes. Individuals shall not be permitted to address topics which the council has heard previously on the agenda. The council president may assign a topic raised by any individual during the privilege of the floor to the appropriate council member and or request the city clerk to contact a member of the administration for a review and topics assigned shall be responded to at the next scheduled council meeting. So at this time, is there anyone uh, here wishing to speak under the privilege of the floor? I don't see anyone um, in the, well, do. Um, Jordan Geiger has his hand up. Jordan, if you would unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. <clears throat> yeah, Jordan Geiger, 424 South Michigan Street, um, South Bend, Indiana, <clears throat> sorry, unit uh, 660. I just <clears throat> wanted to make the comment just to urge um, uh, the council to <clears throat> really to consider releasing demographic data beyond race, gender, um, and geography. I think those are the three categories. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the first round, um, because uh, I remember when we had a meeting with uh, Clerk Jones, uh, a public meeting, she had shared that about, you know, an overwhelming majority of the applicants did have a law enforcement uh, background to whatever degree. And so I know a lot of folks in that call, it was a Zoom call, had expressed that maybe, had some, expressed some concerns about <clears throat> the, um, the, the, the application process, like that it might have been biased, not saying that it was, but just that if there's an overwhelming majority of <clears throat> applicants with a law enforcement background, then what does that say about that process? So I think that's just important to um, um, consider. And then also um, I would urge the council to, or we, I would really say on behalf of BLM because we talked a little bit about it. <clears throat> that um, um, Jordan, if it was something we've talked about already, um, that can't be addressed as oh, an item right. to be talked about, but you are, um, you can email that to us if you would like it, you know, for consideration. But I, we did take the notes of your request on the demographic <clears throat> data and how you'd like it released, but you can't speak on anything that's already been spoken. That's right, I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No <clears throat> problem, no problem, thank you. Hello again. Hi, Mary Bundy. 318 South Francis Street, South Bend, Indiana, 46617. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is the right place to do this. That's why I waited. Um, I'd like to know where we are with the revision of the noise ordinance. And uh, if someone could speak to that, uh, that I would appreciate it. There's also another um, area that I'm, I, I'm not sure I'm remembering the name correctly. Is it the quality of life ordinance? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the quality of life ordinance I thought was really interesting and I wondered why maybe the noise ordinance isn't combined with that quality of life ordinance because they seem to be very well aligned. And that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll be back in touch with you. Thank you. Mary, if you stick around, okay. Karen will talk to you. I wasn't sure if we were supposed to respond under you the. You can, yeah. Okay. I think I'll let okay. you know where we're at. With I, I'm happy to speak to the noise ordinance. It's going to be reviewed by the. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there is any uh, other uh, people that would like to speak on the privilege of the floor. I don't, I don't see, see any. anyone um, else expressing interest to speak on privilege of the floor. 
Okay, then, if there is no other further business at this time, we stand adjourned.